on. Dying to tell you about a court case, but I didn't want you to, didn't want you didn't want to tell you about it until after the assignment was finished because I didn't want to confuse you. <clears throat> but now I'm gonna because I'm all excited. So what this is about is the attribution rules, and you remember the rules for a spouse. Um, if I make a gift, it's a rollover, so there's there's no. Um, capital gain payable by the gift or but attribution happens so far so good if I make a sale at fair market value for example if my spouse gives me cash or if we enter into a loan agreement with uh, uh, interest at the prescribed rate <clears throat> so that's a sale Uh, there's no rollover, therefore it's a capital gain for the gift door. <clears throat> but there's no attribution going forward. Okay, so far? There's actually a third choice that I don't even want you to know about because it'll confuse you. And I don't mind if you don't write it down, but let me tell you what it is. <clears throat> it's a sale. So uh, the gift or gets cash or a loan or whatever. Actually can get a rollover. <clears throat> and attribution back. I have never seen this actually happen, but there is the rule, and obviously in this court case, uh, somebody used this, and uh, uh, that's what the court case is about. Do you have an assignment for me? Oh, um, yeah. Can I have it right now? Oh. <clears throat> is there a name for that other hybrid? No, let's just call it type three. Okay. <clears throat> I'll show you in a second. Thank you. Actually, I'm not sure why someone would want to do it. Like, like maybe it's um, something to do with tax rates. Like maybe they wanted income to be put into the lower income spouse's hands or something. Again, I've, I've actually never seen it done. In fact, I'm not even sure it existed before I read this court case. I mean, that, that's how obscure it is. It's, it's something you'll likely never see in practice or on an exam, trust me. <clears throat> so here's what this person did. Let's call him Mr. Lipson because that's his name. <laughs> Mr. Lipson. He wants to do a deal like um, Singleton did. Remember that Singleton court case? So that's the chap. He was a lawyer. <clears throat> and he took money from his law firm and used that to buy a house. And then he borrowed money at the bank to put back in the law firm. And the money that he borrowed, he deducted the interest on because he said, well, the direct use of the funds was to put money into my law firm. And that was okay. <clears throat> you recall that one went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Here's what Mr. Lipson did. He didn't have a law firm, but he had a corporation. And um, uh, I'm not sure what the actual numbers are. I'll, I'll make up some numbers. Let's say the corporation was worth uh, $500,000. And he owns the shares. He sells the shares to his wife. And she goes to the bank and borrows money to buy the shares from him. So the shares go from husband to wife. Wife borrows at the bank to pay husband. And pays it? Yep. <clears throat> now I'm going to erase these two because 
this is the one that he applied in this case. He made an election on his tax return to apply this one. So I'm going to erase these two. So now he's sitting on cash, and she's got his shares. He says, I don't want to pay tax on my sale of shares to wife, but I'm happy if the income that she earns on the shares gets attributed back to me. That's okay with me. He uses the money to buy a house. <clears throat> okay. Wife says, I've got this bank loan, and I suspect the bank loan was a was pretty high interest rate because the only collateral they would have had were his were the shares that she bought. So my, my guess is it was sort of like a prime plus three or something, fairly high interest rate. But now they've got better collateral because they just bought a house. So she goes back to the bank and she replaces the bank loan, refinances it, let's say. and puts a mortgage on the house. So now the bank's just got like um, real collateral, you know, house and therefore it's, I mean these days you can get a house loan for 3.2% or something, relatively low interest rate. So where they're sitting now is that they've got a house and there's a mortgage on the house and she takes the position, and this is right, that the, um, house loan was a replacement for the loan that she used to buy the shares. Therefore, the interest on the house loan should be deductible to her, just like the interest on the first bank loan would have been deducted, deductible by her because she used the first bank loan to buy the shares. You okay so far? Because there's actually a rule in the Income Tax Act that says if you refinance a loan, uh, the second loan is deemed to be used for the same thing that you uh, used the first loan for. So the only thing that really changed as far as the loan is concerned is the security. Now it's, it's security on, on the house, that's, that's what a mortgage is. So the interest expense is like the investment expenses? So interest expense is like an investment expense. So if this were a senile problem, that interest expense would be increasing her uh, senile account. The thing that we need to know for this case is that this interest expense was deductible to her, and, and that's as it should be, because uh, the Income Tax Act, as I said, says that loan two is for the same purpose of loan one, loan one if it's just a replacement for it. So deductible, like you mean against the, any inve investment income she has? Any investment income, for example, if she gets dividends on these shares. But how can she use the house that her husband bought when it's not her house? That's an excellent question. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I thought about that today. Uh, my family home is in my wife's name. Uh, I could probably borrow money against it if I had her consent. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a security issue. It's not a tax issue. It's just a collateral mm -hmm. issue. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that she had the consent of Mr. So it'd be like co-signing a loan, sort of? Exactly, yeah. Or maybe the house is in both their names or something, I'm not really sure. But the point is that her interest on the, on the house mortgage is deductible. Mm -hmm. And this is what Mr. was trying to accomplish. He wanted at the end of the day to have a house and to have a house mortgage and for the house mortgage to be deductible. You okay so far? Mm -hmm. This goes all the way from lower courts, blah, 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 up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And it's, it's not even fought on these issues because he was right as far as the attribution rules were concerned. This was all tickety-boo. There was no problem with the way he interpreted the Income Tax Act. Turned into a GAR case. Revenue Canada said, we can't figure out any way to fight this thing except on the general anti-avoidance rule, and that's what happened. This Lipson is a GAR case, and 
they lost. But it was close. It was four to three. That's as close as you can get. That's how complicated these things are and how tough it is to figure out whether the GAR should apply or not. Four to three. And every time I read it, I, I, I am shocked by, because I'm thinking, you know what, okay, I, I get that all these steps kind of work, but you know what, the thing stinks to high heaven because like he got six steps and obviously he was trying to sort of, you know, make something fit and I don't really know if I like it, but it was four to three. Lipson lost or CRA lost? Lipson lost. Yeah. So the takeaway from that is, is that um, even sometimes if you make all the rules work, maybe he just tried to make too many rules work or something and somebody said, you know what, it just doesn't work if you've, if you've got so many steps. It was held to be a misuse of the attribution rules. The court said, you know what, the attribution rules were meant to do something else. It wasn't meant to do this. Singleton was never fought on a GAR issue. It was just fought by CRA all the way through, including to Supreme Court, just on whether it worked from the, from the standpoint of interest deductibility. So, I guess this was more of what was the intent of all these actions? Very good point. And I think the intent was probably to get an interest deduction on something that at the end of the day probably shouldn't have had an interest deduction on. Whereas if they would have fought Singleton on that, they may have been like a similar case, but really close kind of decision. Singleton was a little bit less crazy, right? There was only like two steps, not all of these. Yeah. And I think the reason why, why CRA didn't try to use GAR in the Singleton case was that if they had lost, Whenever you pull out a big weapon in court, if you lose, it will go against you forever, especially at the Supreme Court, because everything the Supreme Court does is major precedent setting. So I think CRA was comfortable enough in their position on the Singleton case and too afraid to use GAR in case it went against them. In this case, they felt, I think, that they only had one option. They felt confident about it and, and went with it. Question over here? No, this would only apply, in fact, to spouses. So uh, you and I probably couldn't do this deal, but it could only be done with a spouse because it needs this rollover. Because if he had to pay tax on the capital gain on his shares, that would have been uh, too high a price to pay. It wouldn't have been worth it then to get a, a little interest deduction. Uh, on the, um, on the interest expense. And just before I go to the next question, I just want to fill in one gap. So the income or loss that got attributed back to him is her investment loss with regard to these shares. So in a given year, she might have got $1,000 worth of dividends or something, and she might have paid $30,000 in interest. It's the $20,000 net loss, let's call it, that got attributed back to Mr. So that, I just want to make that clear in case I didn't before. Yes? Where do you go to like, read about all these things? What happens is that Supreme Court cases to do with taxes, <clears throat> well, and actually a lot of things, actually get not necessarily press coverage because tax cases are pretty uh, obscure. But all of the accounting firms and some of the law firms uh, will send out sort of messages about this stuff. Um, It'll be on their website, and if you're on their mailing list, you get this automatically. Lipson is on D2L. It's under Chapter 9. I, I stuck it there weeks ago, but I thought, you know, let's just not go to this because there's enough effort to learn the other uh, attribution rules. Yes? Can you just verify for me that the tape is working? That the camera's working? Yes, it is. Thank you. A red, well, light, I, a red light is on. That's I good turned thing. it on this time, so I don't want it to be. Thank you. The implication there being. Yeah, it's okay if it's your fault. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for listening. I was excited to talk to you about that. It's got nothing to do with uh, your final exam or anything like that. I just wanted to uh, talk about it.
Remember we were having a discussion about mark to market. So if we have an acquisition of control, also called a change of control of a corporation, As we said, there are uh, rules that restrict the losses going forward in the case of non-capital losses, and net capital losses get canceled. I do have all the assignments, right? And then on top of that, there's uh, these mark-to-market rules where if the tax value Tax value means like my adjusted cost base or my UCC is higher than fair market value. I'm deemed to have sold it uh, and reacquired it at fair market value. In that case, a loss happened and the loss gets added to my non-capital non losses in the case of depreciable property. It, it's like I claimed uh, extra CCA all at once. Uh, or in the case of capital property, my adjusted cost base gets reduced. This gets added to my net capital losses, and then those net capital <coughs> losses disappear. <clears throat> you said mark to market only happened if, if there was a depreciation. Correct. Mark to market only happens downward. You okay so far? Yeah. I can also, though, once that's happened to me and I say, oh, shoot. I say, ah, I had these other assets that had actually increased in value. I wish I could do something with those. And the answer is you can. Let's look at page 424. Bullet point that says non-depreciable capital property. <coughs> To the extent the fair market value of non-depreciable property goes down, it's deemed to be a capital loss, gets added to net capital losses, gets canceled, can't be carried forward. To alleviate the possibility that such a loss might be eliminated forever, the corporation can elect to recognize accrued gains, if they exist, on other stuff. So on, on these properties that I, I marked down, mark to market, they went down. But maybe I've got some properties over here that it actually appreciated. Here I've got to report this loss. On these, if I want to, I can step up my adjusted cost base and report a gain. The gain gets soaked up by the loss, and I no longer have any loss that disappears. I have instead increase the adjusted cost base of other assets that were not marked down. I'll show you an example. This is an actual example from one of my clients. They had uh, two assets. Um, one was they had bought shares of a company. And the other asset was um, a bunch of real estate, so uh, retail stores. Uh, class 1. What's the CCA rate? 6%. Retail stores. 4% if it's a um, apartment building or residence. 6% for a business um, building like this and uh, how much for manufacturing? 10%. 10%. The shares had gone down in value <clears throat> by a lot. I, th I think they actually went down something like $15 million. What? One five. This, this is a big company. This, this was my, my largest uh, client at the time. There's another marker right there. Thanks. So the shares went down in value, and there was an acquisition of control. And they started looking around for other assets that maybe they could step up. 
And it turned out that the value of their real estate portfolio, these retail stores, had gone up considerably. So this markdown was 15 million. And their stores have probably gone up in value by, uh, I'll say, 40 million. Increase in value. They were allowed to increase the adjusted cost base and the UCC by $15 million. Now, this was their um, UCC. This was their original cost. So a few things happened. First of all, their UCC got moved up to this much, and they had a giant capital gain. So the UCC went up, and there was a, just a deemed capital gain. The rule says you can increase your UCC and have a big capital gain. Big capital gain. But here they had a big capital loss. Big capital gain, big capital loss. <coughs> no net capital gain. Yes? So you can choose what, which assets to increase? Pick and choose. And they chose these. Do they have to do it within a certain time frame of the acquisition change? Yes, they have to do it, I think, by the time they file their next tax return for, this, for the period that started the day after the... Um, that stub year? This stub... Uh, the year after the first year after the stub period. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, it's something they have to do. I mean, they can't just let this go for five years and then come back and say, hey, you know what, this would be good. So big capital gain offset by big capital loss, no net capital gain. And this is only uh, non-depreciable capital property that can be offset? Or is it any kind of... Uh, this... This is depreciable property. Uh, I'll get back to in a second to what the textbook says. Next thing that happened is that they also had recapture. Because they went from a UCC that was down here, and their new UCC is this number. So this is both their new adjusted cost base and new UCC. Therefore, going forward, they're going to claim 4% capital cost allowance based on this as opposed to the UCC that they had been running the day before. Do you mean 6%? 6%, pardon me. So if this step up was, was on the order of 15 million, 15 million times 6% is, is more capital cost allowance each year. For that though, they had a little bit of recapture. Between their UCC and the original cost, which was a little higher, they did pay tax on some recapture. They were happy to do that, to get the benefit of this large UCC going forward. So big capital loss, big capital gain wiped out. They got to choose how much to elect at. As I said, the increase in value was 40 million. They only went this high because they wanted the full capital gain sheltered by the big capital loss, and they only had $15 million of capital loss, so they didn't crank it up all the way to 40. Had they had a $40 million capital loss on mark-to-market assets, they could have gone higher. Yes? Um, could 
they have uh, just mark to market enough so that the capital gain plus the recapture equals 15 million? So it would completely offset? No, it wouldn't completely offset because the capital losses, you can't use the capital losses against recapture. So they would have had to pay tax and recapture either way. Again, they weren't fussed about the tax and the recaptures. Obviously something they had to take into account, but it, it wasn't a problem. They were overjoyed to have more CCA going forward. Textbook says, to alleviate the possibility that such a loss might be eliminated forever, the corporation can recognize accrued gains if they exist on any non-depreciable or depreciable property creating a capital gain and or recapture that can off, offset the capital loss created in the deemed year or any unused capital loss carryovers from a previous year. So I, I wish they hadn't, I wish this title on this wasn't non-depreciable capital property because as you see this process here works on depreciable property as well as non-depreciable. It says, however, the use of losses to offset recapture might not be the best use of the losses if the non-capital losses, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, the election is most often used on non-depreciable. In this case, the recapture was so low that it made sense to do. If the cost was up here, the recapture wouldn't, it would have been too large and it wouldn't have been worth doing it. But luckily, the cost and the UCC were relatively close and luckily the appreciation in value was very high. CRA uh, looked at this very closely, but it wasn't at all about or, or their issues, and they had a lot of issues. This is a three-year uh, discussion with CRA. It wasn't about the interpretation of the Income Tax Act. It was whether these stores were actually worth what the company said they were. And uh, CRA sent valuators across the country, this was a, a large chain, to uh, make sure that the values were right, and it turned out that they were. Uh, question here first. Well, it's just that we read that creating a capital gain and or a recapture that can offset is, I know that the recapture is created, but it almost implies that you can offset it with the recapture. It kind of does, but it's wrong. Okay. Don't worry about it. Can you give us an example of a capital non-depreciable? Yes. Uh, in this case, it was uh, shares that went down. Shares in a particular company. If they own shares in a different company, or a piece of land, or something like that, a non-depreciable capital property, they could have done this with that, and there wouldn't have been any, any uh, recapture deal. They would simply have a capital gain that would be offset, and the cost base would go up. So besides non-depreciables, the most likely other thing is actually shares in something else if, if they owned another company uh, or land, let's say. <clears throat> and you're kind of implying that the person or the group that had the company before the acquisition of control is the ones doing all this, or this is actually the new... This is the new regime. The new group. Yep, yes. Okay. Um, for the recognizing capital gains, you wouldn't have to recognize the entire $40 million increase? You, you? No. no. You can pick and choose. It, it's an election, and they happen to choose 15 because that's the amount of capital losses they had on the other side. Yeah, if you were locked in and had to do the whole 40, uh, that wouldn't have been good. Because they would have had then a larger capital gain than they had capital losses to uh, offset. If you don't mind, I'm going to move on. I'd be happy to answer questions about this uh, at the end of class, if, the, if there are any more. Please go to page 434. And pull out your calculators. So what I'd like to do now is, is we were talking about this uh, integration thing. 
And as we go on, we, uh, you'll notice the, the calculations use closer to more real numbers. I'd like to make it as real as possible now by using actual Manitoba numbers for the page 434 jut diagram. So let's start with $1,000 worth of business income. And let's say that this is uh, business income of a CCPC greater than $500,000. How much is the corporate tax? He said reaching for the tables. I like table C1. And I like that middle column. And rather than going through all four steps, somebody just showed out to me what the total federal tax rate is. Fifteen percent. And how much is the corresponding Manitoba rate? Twelve percent for a total of? Therefore, my corporate tax, instead of $250, is? Leaving retained earnings of seven hundred thirty dollars in retained earnings, and now we look at the individual side. So that's a dividend of uh, seven thirty. Now we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to go to page 391. This is an eligible dividend. We're going to learn more about eligible. It's an eligible dividend. And what's the tax rate on eligible dividends in Manitoba? 32%. And this is... Um, Combined federal and Manitoba. So seven hundred and thirty dollars. You're saying that these listed by province are including the federal? Correct. And how much is seven thirty times thirty two? Two thirty four. And my after tax net cash to the shareholder is? Because this is the 32% is on the actual. I said we're oh. cheating. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Question was why isn't it on 32% uh, of the grossed up amount? Because the table on page 391 does this math for the actual amount of the dividend. <clears throat> Net tax in the shareholders' hands? You mean after tax? Yes, after tax. 496. As compared to $540. Ouch. And that's analyzed as follows the tax on $1,000 of corporate income is $270. And the tax paid by the individual shareholder is two thirty four for a total tax of five hundred and four dollars. And that's just another way to get four ninety six after tax.
You okay so far? So now if you go down to the bottom, or sorry, the effective rate of tax, rounded, is 50.4%. being $504 divided by $1,000. <clears> and if the person had earned this income personally, not through a corporation, how much would the tax be? Back to page 391. Forty-six percent. Forty-six percent. Does everybody see that? Ordinary income and interest. Ordinary income includes salaries, for example, or business income earned by an individual. So the amount of double taxation, trust me, it's actually 46.3. So the amount of double taxation is 50.4 minus 46.3, which I make out to be about 4.1%. This is why, rather than suffer 4.1%, people bonus down, as we talked about last time, if I have, say, $1.2 million active income in my CCPC, I don't want to pay any tax in the CCPC at this crazy rate. So I pay myself a salary or bonus and get taxed at 46.3. Because if I leave it in the company and then pay it out later as a dividend, I'm going to pay combined 50.4. So 4.1% is the sort of over-taxation. Let's see if our math is correct. Turn the page to page 436. Double taxation in Manitoba, uh, close enough. We got 4.1, they got 4.15. There's probably some rounding errors that I made or something. <clears throat> Homework assignment for you. Do this on your own time, don't hand it in. Do the same thing on page 435, using the rates on page 391, and see if you get, on page 436, a tax savings for Manitoba of 0.6. The purpose for asking you to do that is just so that you understand sort of how the integration things work. And it's nice to have a, a great example there with, with the answer close by. And I've already shown you how to do it. Excuse me. But all of those rates that we used from page 391 are somewhere in the tax app? If we can find them? No. No? No. Okay. Oh, are the provincial rates like published somewhere else? Or somewhere else? Well, if they're not there. They're in the income tax app. Oh, okay. So all all of the um, corporate and individual rates, including at each uh, each okay. tax bracket, are all on the tables. Okay. Please go to page four thirty one. <clears throat> Bottom of the page, full rate taxable income and grip. So we've got a CCPC that carries on business. And it pays tax, let's say, on some of its income at the low rate. We showed last time that CCPCs, there are two rates of tax, low rate and high rate. The low, low rate is on active business income less than 500. 
and the high rate is on active business income higher than 500. And let's say that um, the people who own a company didn't take my advice and they didn't pay down uh, bonuses to reduce their income in the company to 500. So they've, they've got some company that was taxed at the high rate and some company that was taxed at the low rate. That's actually pretty common. We have to have a way to figure out when they ultimately pay out a dividend whether the retained earnings that are being paid out suffered tax at the high rate, in which case we should get the big gross up and, and big credit, or if they, the retained earnings suffered tax at the low rate, in which case we get the small gross up and small credit. The first type of dividend we call eligible dividends, big gross up, big credit, and then non-eligible or ineligible are small gross up, small credit. How do we figure out what category of retained earnings the dividends were paid out of? We have something called the GRIP account. This is a side calculation that CCPCs do on their tax return. And here's how it works. Bottom paragraph, CCPCs keep track of this type of after-tax income by maintaining the general rate income pool. Remember what the general rate is? On the um, table C1, that middle column, the high rate income, is, is referred to as general active business income. That's CCPC taxable income higher than 500, active business income, and all public company income. We refer to that as, as the general rate. And you recall that the 13% um, the rate reduction there is, is also called the general rate reduction. It's not called that in this uh, table, but it's called that in the textbook. So the general rate income pool. A corporation's grip is increased annually by 72% of its full rate taxable income. They pick 72% on the basis that the average uh, federal and provincial corporate taxes at that rate are about 28%. So 72% is just an arbitrary number they picked. We're going to learn a little later on how to calculate the grip. But I just want to introduce you to the concept now. So it's CCPCs that earn active business income higher than 500000 They paid the high rate of tax so that when we pay dividends out of that component of retained earnings, pay dividends out of GRIP, those are eligible dividends, big dividend tax credit, big gross up. Chapter 12. Please go to page 466. Where it says sale of shares to other shareholders. You can cross out everything that happened before that in Chapter 12. I think I gave you an email earlier, earlier in the week telling you about that. I want to talk about two different ways that a shareholder can get money for their shares. The first way is pretty straightforward. Uh, if I'm a shareholder, I can sell my shares. I get proceeds, I got an adjusted cost base, I get a capital gain. Hopefully it's capital gain that I can uh, use the capital gain exemption on. Um, but my tax result is pretty straightforward. I've got a sale and I, and I treat it as such. Are we talking public, private? CPC? Public, private, anything? any kind of corporation. Okay. 
The other way I can get money for my shares is if the corporation buys them back from me. <clears throat> and let's talk about that. Let's look at the bottom of page 467. And I've got some shares that have redemption price of $50,000. Redemption price means that's what the corporation is buying them back from me for $50,000. And because, let's say I deal not at arm's length with the corporation, that better be fair market value, right? Because Section 69 will punish us, will cause us double taxation if it's not fair market value. So let's assume it's fair market value. So I've got these shares and the company is buying them back for me. My paid up capital. I acquired these shares for five grand and I bought them directly from the company. So the company recorded this journal entry. Debit cash, credit capital stock or something like that. So the paid up capital is what we refer to as the amount that's actually sitting on the balance sheet of the company for my shares. And again, I bought them from the company in the first place. I paid five grand. My paid up capital is five grand. And also my adjusted cost base is $5,000 because that's what I paid for them. But the paid up capital is, is another uh, attribute that they have and it'll be important in a second. Because what happens is that the company is essentially giving me some of the retained earnings. The $50,000 they're giving me, it's almost like I'm getting a dividend. It's not quite a dividend, but it's coming from the same place. It's coming from retained earnings. So I have a deemed dividend on my tax return of the redemption price minus the paid up capital, $45,000. Gross up. We have to figure out if it's uh, eligible or non-eligible. The, the sort of cash amount of the dividend, the actual amount is 45, and it'll get grossed up by something, and there will be a dividend tax credit of something. You okay so far? Now, I also, since this redemption deal is sort of like a sale, so I also have a sale. So I've got proceeds and adjusted cost base. We said before the adjusted cost base is five grand which is fine, and my deemed proceeds is the redemption price less the dividend, which actually brings me back to the paid up capital. So my proceeds equals my paid up capital, 5,000, and my adjusted cost base is 5,000, so I have a zero capital gain. So essentially, I might have been thinking that this was a capital gain transaction, but it actually turns into a dividend tra transaction. So I might have been thinking, hey, I'll, like, I'll get uh, capital gain exemption and stuff like that. It's a deemed dividend instead. As a matter of fact, I'm probably paying higher tax on this deemed dividend than I would on a capital gain. Those um, page 391 uh, rates, let's go back there quickly. If I'm in the... <coughs> highest tax bracket, pardon me. If I'm in the highest tax bracket, on a capital gain, I only pay 23% in Manitoba. On an eligible dividend, I would pay 32%. And again, this is on the actual amount. And if it's a darn non-eligible dividend, I'm paying 39%. So anytime somebody is selling their shares back to the company, they need to know about this because maybe they'd be better off if they found another buyer for the shares who is not the company, and therefore they can get capital gain treatment. Yes? But is this the same thing that would happen if the company decided that they wanted to buy back shares and make them treasury shares? Like, your implication was it's up to the shareholder to decide 
with who they want to sell them to as opposed to the corporation says, no, 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 we're buying back shares. So. Sometimes the corporation says, we're just buying back shares and you have no choice. They cancel your shares and they send you a check and this is the result. Does it matter if you purchase them from the company or? We're about to go into that. Okay. Yes? What is the, the loss? When you get a negative dividend, so it would be a capital loss? I'm about to go into that. So this is a situation where the redemption price is higher than the paid up capital and also higher than the adjusted cost base. Let's answer that question first. Let's say that the redemption price is only $4,000. There's no such thing as a negative dividend. We wouldn't have that, but we would have a capital loss. This is for all kinds of shares. Shares that I bought directly from Treasury or shares that I bought from another individual. Let's look at um, shares bought from somebody else. So let's say that instead of a redemption, I sell the shares to Ms. X for $50,000. And what's my result? It's a capital gain of 45,000. Let's say that Ms. X, for some reason, the shares are redeemed the next day. I don't know why that would happen, but let's see what the math looks like. The deemed dividend math is the same. She inherits the paid up capital that I had. Because the shares didn't change. The paid up capital on the company's books didn't change. It's still $5,000. So she has a deemed dividend of $45,000. Her proceeds of disposition, $5,000. Therefore, she has a capital loss of $45,000. She has a deemed dividend of $45,000 and a capital loss that she cannot use to offset this deemed dividend. She has to wait for another capital gain someday of $45,000. Terrible situation. Again, a situation where somebody very much wants to know, needs to know things about her shares. Like, okay, I'm buying these shares from you, Dan. What's the uh, paid up capital of these shares? What would happen if the company redeemed them the day after? How much tax would I have to pay? Because the paid up capital doesn't change, only the adjusted cost base changes. If you were doing a stock, if you were buying these shares on the stock market, none of that comes into effect, correct? If I'm buying... Like, sales of shares to other shareholders, if you buy shares on the stock market, you're buying somebody else's shares, right? Right. So when you go to... Let's say the company buys them back. Yeah. I, I need to know what the paid up capital is. Well, and you're saying that that information is available to investors on the stock market? If the company were, in a, were buying the shares back, they would tell me how much the paid up capital is and therefore how much I'd expect to have a deemed dividend for. And then I'd have to figure out my own capital gain because only I know what my cost base is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? One more and then I need to move on. Okay, well, with that, they tell you when they're redeeming it, but if you want to find out, I mean, can you, I don't know, check their website or something? Yeah, short answer maybe, or maybe they're... Um, because no one gets like the actual certificates anymore. So. Quite right. Um, I'm going to say it happens seldom enough that um, uh, most investors I mean, don't have to worry about it. Um, and again, it's not always a choice. Like sometimes they just say, like, here are your shares. And here's how much uh, the tax 
or, or how much the uh, deemed dividend will be. Plus, they would give you a T5 slip, uh, you know, next uh, February. Um, now, if it was a um, a choice deal, where they say, "Look, we're we're offering you, uh, we've got a bunch of cash," as as actually a lot of companies do now, um, and they might say in the next year to be offering to buy back shares from uh, taxpayers, from shareholders, uh, in order to make an informed decision. You would need that info, like what's the paid up capital, and they would probably give you a circular of some kind that says, here's what the, the tax results would be if, if you bought the shares back for $25 a share. I, I hope. Uh, no, I, that, actually that would likely be required disclosure by the um, Securities Commission would, would require people to disclose that. Say I started a company my own company and it needs $100,000 to start with. You'll notice that a lot of the examples we've done so far have very low paid up capital like say $1,000 or $100 or something. The usual thing in a, in a case like this is we would put in say $99,000 as a loan and $1,000 as uh, share capital. And the reason for that is if I've got an opportunity to take money out of the company, I'd rather just get repaid some of my loan rather than doing some kind of uh, redemption or something like that. And getting repaid a loan isn't, it isn't a taxable transaction. It's not income. I'm just getting repaid my loan. But what if we goof up and instead of this deal, we instead put the whole $100,000 in as share capital. Private companies can reduce their share capital after the fact. They get a do-over. Please look at page 468, Reduction of Paid-Up Capital. So if, for sake of discussion, I, I want to take out 25000 I can go visit my lawyer and we do up some resolutions and my new paid-up capital is $75,000. There's no tax on this transaction, but my adjusted cost base gets reduced from 100 to 75, uh, sort of as it should be. So it's just a do-over, and that's available for private companies. And it's just legal. And it's just a legal thing. It's just uh, um, resolutions and, and some papers to file. I want to talk now about transferring assets to corporations, starting on page 469. So we're talking about transferring some of my personal assets to my company. So first thing is that section 69 applies. This has to be a fair market value transaction. That normally means capital gains and stuff like that. Oh, crap. I wish I were married to my company so I could get a rollover. Some people are. Some people are. Well, the tax system allows us to get a rollover in this case. On a transfer of property of me, a shareholder, to my corporation, as long as I take back some shares, I can get a rollover, and here's how it works. <clears throat> If you look at page 470, and a very common time when this happens is if somebody, say, runs a business uh, as a proprietor and they want to instead be a corporation, so they have to transfer the business assets into the corporation. So in this case, 
my building cost $100,000, the UCC is $90,000, and the fair market value is $130,000. So on a usual just transaction, which would have to be a fair market value, I'd have, what, a capital gain of 30 and a recapture of 10. If I take back some shares, or at least one share, I get to make an election that is declared to the government I want to do something fancy. I can choose what my proceeds are. I can go anywhere between 90 and 130. What if I pick 92? I'd have some recapture. I don't want that, so I'm going to pick 90. $90,000 will be my proceeds. That will be the election. The company is deemed to buy my building from me at 90. So their acquisition price is also the same as the elected value. In fact, it's an election that the two of us make. I sign it for myself, and I also sign it as president to the company. So the UCC going forward for the company is 90, and they start claiming CCA based on 90, just as I would have if I had still owned it. You okay so far? We call this a Section 85 rollover. Section 85 is the Income Tax Act section that provides for this. We refer to $90,000 as the elected value. That's the value that I chose as my proceeds and which the company has elected also as their acquisition price. Very important, what do I take back from the company? Do I get paid cash for this or exactly how does that work? And we need to take back, I still need to take back $130,000 worth of consideration because this still is a Section 69 transaction. So I need to take back some stuff that adds up to $130,000. Now, as I said before, I need to take back at least one share. In fact, what I'd like to take back, I'm always looking for ways to take money out of the company, like cash. So what I'd love to do is for the company to give me as much cash as they can and where I can still make this election I want to to elect at $90,000 proceeds. I can take back cash from the company up to $90,000. Pay no tax. The other $40,000 to get me up to one hundred thirty. dollars I take in shares. So this is cash and this is shares. What kind of shares? Usually preferred shares. Because it's easier to explain the value of the preferred shares. Someday if CRA comes to see me, they say, Dan, we wanted you to make sure that you took $130,000 out. And I say, yes, I took out uh, 90 of cash and 40 of preferred shares. Uh, the preferred shares are redeemable for $40,000 exactly. That means that I can cash them in at the company with $40,000. Yes? So I guess what you're saying is that if there have been common shares, there really is no market because you're the only shareholder. So you decided so this way you make sure it's worth exactly. That's exactly right. For common shares, it is much harder to determine what they are worth. And I run the risk of either getting less than 130 in total or, 100 or more than 130, both of which would offend Section 69. So I want to make sure I get exactly fair market value. Yes? If you have the preferred shares that are redeemable at 40,000, you don't trigger capital gain when you redeem, if you redeem them either. If I have shares worth uh, with the redemption value of 40,000, I do not trigger a capital gain. What I get is a deemed dividend because the paid up capital of these shares 
is zero or one dollar for tax purposes. That's what happens. The preferred shares? The preferred shares. Why? Because I have actually only paid tax on $90,000 worth of value here, and the other $40,000 isn't a tax paid amount. Oh, it's like funny money. It's like funny money, therefore I shouldn't get a, a, tax, tax, break. a tax break when I cash in that $40,000. Okay. I got to tell you, that's a very astute question. It's one that I, I don't want to confuse you by answering, but, but it's a good question. Someday when I cash in the 40, what's my result? It is a deemed dividend because my paid up capital is zero or one dollar. And the reason my paid up capital is so low is because I elected at $90,000 and I sort of used that all up by taking $90,000 cash. So the adjusted cost base and paid up capital of these shares is $1. But you were saying you don't expect us to know that part for the exam. No. I do know, need you to know that the adjusted cost base is a dollar. Is a dollar. Okay. I'm not as concerned if you don't know the paid up capital is a dollar. Now, in my example, I took back cash. If the company didn't have cash, they can we can do a loan, that's fine too. And in fact, that's the example in the book here. Debt owing to shareholder, $90,000. In fact, that's probably the most common thing because especially in a startup situation, the, the company wouldn't have a lot of cash anyway to pay me. So they just give me a shareholder loan payable for $90,000. That means when the company has cash later on, I can take that $90,000 out tax-free, which is fine. We call non-share consideration. So this, this $40,000, which I suggest should be preferred shares, that's share consideration. Consideration is, is what you pay for something, the type of thing that you use to pay. Shares for 40 and non-share consideration, i.e. cash or debt, for 90, up to the tax value of what you transferred in. If we had taken out cash of 110, we could not elect at less than 110. Therefore, recapture of 20. You cannot elect at less than the non-share consideration you take back. Another word for non-share consideration is boot, B-O-O-T. It's an or another one of these old English terms. So if I sometimes refer to boot, I mean non-share consideration, could be cash, could be uh, debt, that type of thing. Non-depreciable property like, uh, say, land, we elected the adjusted cost base. Eligible capital property, we elected four-thirds the CEC balance. Can anybody fathom why it would be four-thirds? Oh, because, I know, because we do two-thirds to get it down to the UCC value. Close. Damn. We, we do three quarters. Oh, three quarters. Right, 75%. That's right. So what happens is, is uh, and there's an example of it, um, pardon me, on page 483. Um, bottom of the page, the EC, or the uh, cumulative eligible capital balance is $18,000. Fair market value of 100 the range for the elected amount is from the fair market value, well that's too high, we don't want to elect up there because we'll pay tax, down to 24,000 being 18,000 times 4 thirds. Because you recall that we reduced the pool, um, not by the full amount of proceeds, but only by three quarters the amount of the proceeds. That's the only reason. So we elect at 4 thirds of a CEC balance if we have CEC. Now, there are giant um, things to cross out here, which I think I mentioned. Uh, corporate distribution to shareholders is 
starting on page 473. Uh, actually, the rest of the chapter, including crossing out supplement technical information on transferring assets to a corporation. It's just more detail on what I just told you. It's more detail on the Section 85 election. I've told you everything you need to know about that election. And what's in the earlier pages covers it just fine. Just want to cover one more thing before we go. On page 472, we can use the Section 85 election on just about any asset a company has. So that's capital property, inventory, uh, ECE, which is like goodwill, etc., resource property, which you don't need to know about. But there's one I'd like you to mark down that you cannot use. Real property that is inventory. So for example, if I'm a property developer and I've, I'm working on some property that I'm going to sell in parcels and stuff, I cannot use a Section 85 election to transfer that to my company. And finally for tonight, sale of accounts receivable. If I'm selling assets, so I, I, I run a business or my company runs a business and the company is selling assets, not shares, accounts receivable actually turns out to be a capital asset in this situation, which is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, accounts receivable is, is a current asset. It's like inventory. A sale of inventory would give rise to uh, income treatment. but. There's a rule that says that the sale of an accounts, re accounts receivable, in this case of a sale of a business, is a capital transaction. What normally happens is that the buyer and the seller both agree to do an election to treat it as a purchase of a non-capital asset. And there's just a little commentary here on that. I need you to know that as well, please. The benefit to the buyer is that later on if they have a bad debt, that's a fully deductible bad debt, not a capital loss. Uh, the value to the seller is that, I guess the same thing, if they have uh, a capital loss, pardon me, yeah, if they have a loss in the receivable they're about to sell, that would normally be a capital loss except for this election which turns it into an income loss. It's uh, not something you see every day. It's only in the sale of, of a business, but we will have some sale of business uh, transactions later on, later on in this course. Here's how the sale of accounts receivable information is only when you sell your business? Correct. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm sure I can think of other times when it could happen, but the one I want you to know about is on the sale of a business. So you're not talking about when people bundle their ARs and sell them off? No. For those who are, are watching this only on videotape, the question was, uh, are there other transactions involving accounts receivable that might get um, uh, treated this way? The short answer is yes, but you don't need to know about them. So for example, if somebody is just bundling their accounts receivable and selling them in the market, uh, that's not a transaction I need you to, to know about. I just need you to know about the sale of accounts receivable in the context of the sale of an entire business.